What is up, my friends? Seth Mosley here on the Made It in Music podcast. We've got a good one today. We've got my friend Rick Barker, who we're going to be diving into his story. And there's going to be just, I, I know, because every conversation I have with Rick, I walk away with new ideas, new takeaways. So you guys are going to experience the same thing. So this this would be one, if, if any episode we've ever had that you need to like listen with a notepad, this should be the one. So, hey, before we jump in, I wanted to tell you about something that all of us at Full Circle Music are super excited about. Recently, we launched our new product, Track Suite Pro. And Track Suite Pro is designed to be the easiest and fastest tool to create music beds and songwriting tracks for songwriting. And if you've ever tried to record your own song or build tracks on your own, you know that it can take days or weeks and it never sounds as professional as you wanted it to. Track Suite Pro will make your song sound professional in just minutes. So if you want more info about how to get Track Suite Pro, contact support at fullcirclemusic.com today. All right. Today's guest is, like I said, Rick Barker. Rick Barker is a manager, entrepreneur, and consultant with more than 25 years of experience in the music industry. Not only was Rick the former manager of superstar Taylor Swift, he also manages over 1,600 clients, mounting a social media reach of over 10 million. He's the author of the $150,000 music degree, and in February of 2018, he launched the Music Industry Blueprint podcast, which I can't recommend enough. I love that podcast. Rick's mission is to manage artists and help them get their music out there into the world by teaching them to nurture and monetize their fan base. So let's give a warm welcome to one of the industry's best artist developers and longtime friend of Full Circle Music, Rick Barker. What's up, Rick? Thank you, brother. I appreciate this. How you doing, my friend? You you, you hanging in there? I'm good. I'm, I'm good. It's funny because someone asked me not too long ago, they said, what is it that you do for a living? I said, well, now it finally has a word for it. It's called social distancing. I didn't <laughs> know that because for the last three years, I've been teaching people on Zoom and now it's the norm. So yes, that's what I do. I do social distancing. I, I love it. I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, so let's start by learning more about you. How did you get started with music business and, and management and marketing? Sure. So my passion and my goal was radio. That's what I always wanted to do. I never had any desires to be in the record business, in management. Uh, it's just something that kind of takes you down a path. So in that journey of radio, I did my whole entire radio career in Santa Barbara. And I had a choice when I first started. So to back up for a quick second, uh, I, I grew up in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. So I've had the music bug for a while. I interned and swept up at Fame Recording Studio. When my parents were divorced, my mom uh, was dating a drummer by the name of Roger Clark. Now, Roger, if you watch the Netflix documentary on the Muscle Shoals music scene, he was featured in that. Uh, he was has been listed as one of the top 50 drummers in the world. Session guys, you know, would come to Nashville, do all this stuff. So I kind of got hooked on music that way. But I also went to three different high schools. So my sophomore year, the Christians and the jocks took me in. So I went to church and played soccer in the junior year, the same. So I did the same. Then I moved to California, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was a senior in high school and the stoners took me in and I developed an addiction to drugs. So from 18 to like 22 years old, I battled uh, a crack cocaine addiction it's when I got sober, when I got on my knees on April, it was April 4th, 1989. And I'm like, God, let me die. You know, I was just sick and tired of being sick and tired. When that didn't happen, my goal was I have to make up for lost time. So I didn't get a chance to go to college. I went and just started studying for the people that I could. But I heard this ad on the radio. I was living in Los Angeles and it says, do your friends say that you have a voice for radio? come to the Columbia School of Broadcasting, blah, 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 blah. So I went to this orientation, realized that it was some kind of scam, but they mentioned getting internships. So I ended up getting an internship at KISS FM in Los Angeles. Uh, Rick D's, one of the biggest stations ever. And then it was from there that I went to Santa Barbara. Now, the reason that I backed up to share that story is that when I got to Santa Barbara, I had the choice of either chasing a bigger radio job every two years, you kind of just move up the ladder. I realized what God was calling me to do was to be a big fish in a small pond and to take my sobriety and to take my story 
and to take what it is I had done and serve others. So I stayed in Santa Barbara the whole entire time. I've done every English speaking radio station possible, but it was in 2001 when I was asked to build a country radio station. So I was the guy that, you know, you get, you play a country song backwards, you get your truck back, your dog back, your girl back. You know, I was that always making fun of it. Well, right after 9-11, when I was asked to build this country station, the world was in a different place. And I started listening to the lyrics of these songs, and I absolutely fell in love with country music. And Marb Green, who is a songwriter, had hits over the last 30 years. Him and I are from the same hometown in San Inez. And we did, his brother and I are friends, and we did this thing with the songwriter. So I've always been a fan of the songwriter itself. But I started asking a lot of questions as I became a reporting radio station, which meant that the labels cared and they would bring artists by out on radio tour. So I started asking a lot of questions. I was like, why is it that they don't play? Why is it that we... You know, at the end of the day, if I'm your last visit, why don't we put them in front of an audience? And I started hearing things like, well, they don't have enough material. And I'm like, wait a minute, you sign somebody to a record deal that doesn't have at least 30 minutes of material to play songs? Well, they had this song. I'm like, okay, don't know about that yet. Uh, then they say, well, no one will know who they are and won't show up. I said, but wait, if I play them, and I tell my audience I'm excited about them. And I'm in a small town at that point. It's like I'm I, I'm in the wine country above Santa Barbara. You know, it's like it's one of those towns that's so small that you don't lose your girlfriend. You lose your turn. You know, it's that <laughs> type of town. So I knew that I could get people to these shows. So I started throwing my own shows. And then I went to one of the record companies and I said, hey, what if I could get them paid to come out to California and they're like, there's no way possible. I'm like, but wait a minute. They said, we don't, radio doesn't pay us. We have to foot the bill to do these radio shows. I said, well, let me try. So I called a bunch of radio stations and I said, Hey, if I can get us an artist at the bottom of the chart, would you put up 1500 bucks, three hotel rooms and dinner? And they were like, sure. So I called the labels back in Nashville. I said, I've got seven radio stations. The artists can come out. They'll make 7,500 bucks. I'll tell they're like, how did you get radio to pay? I said, well, you guys are talking to the wrong person. You keep talking to the program director. I went to the sales manager. The sales manager is all about making money. So they're going to go find a venue. The venue is going to put up the money. And then the, the sales manager is going to make the program director promote and play this song because they don't need want that to fail because that's the only way radio stations make money. And as I wrap up this portion of this, because I've talked a very long time and I apologize. No, this is I great, blown. man. I, I actually want to die. I've, I've got questions upon questions. Oh, good. Okay. This. So this is great. So what was interesting is that, so when I called Nashville and I asked them, uh, they, they said, okay, you've got all these stations. And I mean, I, it was great. If you know California, it was to go up. I would pick them up at the airport. We'd go Ventura, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, or Santa Maria, San Luis Obispo. We would, you know, hit Sacramento. We would cut across, come down. We'd hit Bakersfield. We'd hit, you know, it was a nice little run. We had LA. We had everyone. They flew me out, they, they flew me out to Nashville. We paid for me to come here. My first trip to Nashville, we sat down. They loved the idea. I got brought into every record company. They loved the idea. I'm excited. I go back to Santa Barbara. Nothing. No phone calls. No one returning emails. I reached back out. I said, you guys told me that this was a great idea. They said, well, here's the problem. It's now summer. And our regionals for the record companies are out with our bigger artist. So we, they're doing meet and greets and they're doing shows and they're facilitating all this stuff. I said, so wait a minute. So the artist that got signed that you were excited about that came through the radio station now has to sit and wait their turn. It's not like they can just put out music whenever they want. At this time, there was no internet. They're not on Instagram live and TikTok doing anything. They are sitting and they are waiting. And they said, yeah, unfortunately, that's how it works. I said, well, what if I took them on the tour? 
I'm the one who built it anyway. They're like, you'd be willing to do that? I said, yes, I've got to prove this concept. So I get a call, Royce Risser, uh, who's at Universal, uh, hit, calls me up and he says, listen, he said, we've got this kid. He's got this song that's doing well in the Midwest. It's doing well in the South. If it can work in California, we might have ourselves a hit. He said his name's Josh Turner, and the song's called Long Black Train. And I was playing Long Black Train, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, even I can't screw this one up. So Josh Turner was the very first artist on the Nashville 2 radio tour. Then it was, I get a call about this trio. Some people are a little concerned that it might not work. The lead singer is a little, a little out there, you know, just didn't look like a star, sounded like a star. And they wanted to see if this trio could work. And their name was Sugarland. And then I end up with this act uh, that had failed at a couple other artists. And they were their names were Little Big Town. And then Jamie O'Neill comes off of a pregnancy. And so one thing led to another. And that's how I ended up getting myself on the radar from records to things. And then after that, after a while, Scott Borchetta hired me at Big Machine Records and so you were Smith. you were taking these artists who were not getting attention. They had the record deal already, which we could go in a million different directions just based off of what you just said. I think what you just said is probably news to a lot of people listening that getting the record deal in and of itself is not the answer. You you have to fight for attention even after that. So so what you were doing in that process was finding these artists who were kind of on their way up that they were kind of working, they weren't really working. And you basically put together a tour for them that was centered around radio stations. Am I, am I understanding that correctly? Because when someone goes on radio tour, the whole idea is to build these relationships. So when, when they go out and this is, so every dollar that the record company spends on an artist has to be recouped at some point out of the percentage of the artist share of the contract. So when you go out on radio tour and you do all these different things, it's just stacking up money. So the artists are going in debt. A lot of times the, the advance that the artist will get uh, just gives them barely uh, enough money to live, you know, to pay their bills while they're out on radio tour doing this stuff. So what was great was it gave me a way to help the artist put some money in their pocket, kind of show a sigh of relief to the record companies. It was like, okay, here's this cool little tour. Plus it was a great place to practice. You know, it was a great place. It was hard for us in California because it's so expensive to fly people out to get artists, you know? So that's when I went to the stations, that was my selling point. It wasn't, Hey, do you want an artist to come here? I said, Hey, if I can get us an artist, that's at the bottom of the chart, somebody that you're probably going to play their song anyway, would you then be able to do this? I had to go find, could we create this opportunity? Well, that was my, that was going to be my next big question is why, and I don't want to spend too much time on this because radio is really just one part of a, of the entire strategy. And it's, it's increasingly become a smaller part, but still, if you're in country, if you're in yep. Christian, if you're in uh, pop. If you're a songwriter in town, in Nashville. You're trying to get your songs written for radio. Radio, radio still is the is the driver. So, why would a station who didn't even play the song from A, B, or C artists want to pay to bring them out to play a show? Because they wanted to provide some kind of value and experience for their listeners. These. The, the low dose shows it's like radio stations and the people that work at radio stations. And I was one of them for a long time. They're very competitive and they're always trying to make their audience feel that they're connected, that they're in the know that, especially with country music. So it's like when they can say, you know, Mercury records called and they're allowing us the opportunity before anyone gets to see this artist. You know, it's like, we're dramatic in radio. That's what we do. We try to, make it bigger than what it really is half the time. So that's what it did. It allowed them to go sell a sponsorship to a client because the only way that radio stations make money is through advertising. So when they can create opportunities for their listeners, tie a sponsor involved, it's a win-win situation for everyone involved at that point. That's amazing. So I'd love to jump over because I know everybody's interested. You, 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 you kind of 
hinted at it that that putting this model together was what got you hired by Scott Bruschetta. Scott was the uh, founder or founder or, or owner or both of Big Machine Records. He's everything of Big Not Machine Records. Yeah, yeah, he 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 started it. What happened was him and Toby Keith had two labels together and Scott had the promotion side. It was show dog and big machine. And then they decided to split because they couldn't put out as many artists as they wanted to as one label. So they parted and he offered me a job at big machine uh, awesome. to be the West coast regional. And that, uh, was, and that was in radio. So, so how yep. did that turn into you crossing paths with Taylor Swift? So uh, as I started out at Big Machine Records, I was the West Coast Regional. I was responsible for about nine states and 80 radio stations. And when it was Taylor's turn, uh, Jack Ingram was the first artist that we had released on that. Our first song went number one, uh, was a great experience to be a part. So when it was getting ready to be Taylor's turn, uh, he she had only you know, been writing in town from like age 12 to 16. She had just been a writer. She wasn't playing shows. She wasn't doing a lot of this stuff. So Scott said, why don't we send her out to California with you and take her on the, the Nashville to you radio tour is what it was called and let her get some experience and start meeting some of these radio stations. So uh, that's how we got together is that, I mean, he sent her out to me and we spent about 30 days together that changed both of our lives uh, I wanted to teach. She wanted to learn. Uh, previous, earlier, you know, I had coached girls high school soccer. So be it a blessing or a curse, I speak teenage female. Uh, <laughs> so I felt that was, I didn't realize at the time that was probably God preparing me for Taylor. And yeah, it was, that's how I ended up with Taylor. And we went and we just, it just worked. You know, it's like, it was funny because she was so excited and so when you go into it, so it was right after the ACMs, her and her mom flew from Vegas. We, we flew into San Diego. That's where we were going to start our journey. And I had this big red Suburban, looked like a fire truck at the time, big <laughs> red Suburban. So uh, we're starting in San Diego. So I call the station, I order pizza. She's going to go in and play the conference room. And the goal is to get ourselves on the air. That's what you want. You want to get on the air. Uh, if you can get on the air, it means the program or music director felt that something was worthy to share with the audience because they're very particular about that. So as I had called all my stations, this is a story I've never shared on. This, you're the first person to get this story uh, recorded. So hey, there you go. all the stations Exclusive. reminded me, they're like, hey, buddy, listen, you know, uh, we're not going to be able to put her on the air. You can bring her by. You know, we're more than happy to meet her. And, and that just kept happening over and over and over again. So we go down to San Diego. We show up. I've got pizzas delivered. We go into the conference room. And there were three people in the conference room. And I'm like, dude, you killed me. You know, you told me blah, 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 blah. Taylor walks in. You would have thought there were 300 people in the conference room. She went around, firm handshake to every single person. She played that show just like there was 300 people in this conference room. And then she comes out and she's like, so do you think they like me? You think they like me? You think they're going to add my song? And I'm like, oh my gosh. She's, oh. So I sat there. I said, Taylor, I said, listen, I said, I will be as honest with you as you show me you can handle it. I said, but unfortunately, a lot of radio people, they're just going to lie to your face. They're going to tell you how great you are. It was the best conference room visit. We're going to leave and they're not going to add your song and we'll never know what happened or why. And I don't want to curb this enthusiasm that you have. I said, but we've got to figure out a way to get on the radio because I know if we can get on the radio, that will change everything. So as we leave San Diego, our next stop is going to be in Riverside. But on the way, we're stopping by the Taylor Guitar Factory because she was sponsored by Taylor Guitar. So we get to the Taylor Guitar Factory. They take us on a tour and they give her this little baby mini Taylor, little baby Taylor, as they call it. Yeah. So she's in the back seat of my truck. She's playing it. We're driving to Riverside and I get a call from the program director and he's like, remember, don't ask to go on the air. I don't want to have to embarrass you in front of Taylor, but it's a, it's a high traffic day, which means they have a lot of commercials and things like that. So 
originally when Scott had asked to bring her out, he said, Hey, I'd love to send her with a fiddle player and another guitar player. And I said, respectfully, I said, would you just send her and her guitar? I said, everyone's saying that all the young females are manufactured out of Nashville. This was at a very different time. This was back in 2005, 2006. I said, I just want to show them that she's the talent. He's like, yeah, no problem. I'll just send her you. Do whatever you want. Some of the other regionals may want her. But I wanted her and her guitar to show she was the person. So as we're driving in the car, she's playing the song. I said, hey, do me a favor. I said, that part in the song, Tim McGraw, where it says, when you turn your radio on, see if you can get it, the melody and everything to match when you turn K Frog on. So she starts playing <laughs> it and she's like, when you turn K Frog on, I hope it takes you back. Do K, do KZLA. And when you turn KZLA. So all of a sudden, I'm seeing that she can fit these call letters into that melody. So I said, whenever we come to that part of the song, I want you to say the call letters of whatever radio station we're at. And she's like, why? I said, because they have huge egos. And if they hear that, they're going to want to share that this artist is saying their name in the song. I said, I had heard Craig Morgan or somebody do it years ago. And it's not a new trick. It's just one that works. So, yeah. <clears throat> so we get to K Frog. And these are one of the frog stations where it's like the DJs are hoppy and toady <laughs> and all these things. So, so we get into K Frog, we walk in and, and, and Hoppy was funny. He's like, so, and she's in her sundresses and her cowboy boots and she looks like a star. She walks in and he's, he's an older gentleman and he's like, so uh, you're a pretty little thing. Would you come from a fashion show? And uh, they all kind of laughed and she's <laughs> like, no, sir. And he's like, so uh, where's your guitar player? She goes, well, I'm my own guitar player. He's like, well, why don't you play something for us? So she sits down. They're not on the radio. She starts playing this song. She looks at me. She gets to that part. I nod and she says, and she threw K Frog in there. And he's like, and the, and his co host was Toady. So it's Hoppy and Toady. So he's like, Toady, we got to put this girl on the air. This girl sounds fantastic. So what happens is, is while we're waiting for the two songs to put her on the air, she goes on MySpace and tells all her MySpace fans that she's about to be on K Frog. And she puts the phone number, the request line number to the station on K Frog. So she goes on, she sings, the phones light up right across from the station or is this In N Out Burger. It was our first In N Out Burger experience. So after we left, we sit at this In N Out Burger listening to the radio station. And for the next hour, phone call after phone call after phone call about this girl and that's when i called scott and i'm like we got something yeah i said all we have to do is walk in let her get to the conference room she'll take care of the rest and we've got this strategy that's working but she said something right after that she said i want to stop by the drugstore i said what do you want she said i want to buy cards i want to write notes to everyone that we meet and i want them to get them the next day i want to be able to put them in the mailbox so then her mom started writing down every person that we would meet in the back of the tr truck in between these drives, like two hour drives. She'd be handwriting notes to these program directors. And then as they start getting these notes, they're calling Scott going, OK, who is this girl? What 16 year old writes letters? You know, most of them are texting at that time. Texting had just become a thing. Yeah. So it was those little things that just really made such a huge difference that really got me seen. It's what makes you different that's going to allow you to win, not what makes you the same. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. I, thank you for letting me share that story. I haven't shared that story. It was like in a long, long time. I've talked to people, but never on a podcast. Man, I, I love hearing that. And really what you're kind of hitting the, the nail on the head on is just taking every opportunity and squeezing every last bit of juice out of it. That's you know, so many artists, you know, don't don't understand like when they walk into a radio tour conference room, like you almost make it sound more glamorous than it actually is. Those three people, it's fluorescent light. There's no vibe. They're they're probably have seen five other artists that it's week. The sales of, guy who was forced to be in there that's on his phone typing the whole time. Exactly. They don't care. Like they're you you the fact that you can win them over, like that's that's huge. But so many artists go in go into these things thinking 
oh, I, I, I got to do the, the dog and pony show. I hate doing this kind of stuff. But really what it sounded like was her genuine enthusiasm to actually be there and brighten she their She just day. loved people. She just yeah. loved people. And here's the thing. Quality is expected. Different is the new better. And what made her different was this enthusiasm. What made her different was the handwritten notes. What made her different was the walking around to everyone in the room and shaking their hand. And what made her different was the, the love she showed to the secretary and to everyone. I mean, yeah. that's what made her different. And while everyone other artists were all coming through because they all on the same thing. It's like in one week, a radio station can have five people that parades through. So at the end of the week, when they're looking, when it comes time for that song to be added and you've got a stack and they're all in a stack, but also you look up and you see this handwritten note on your desk from this person. When it comes time, it's like that. What's going to make you stand out different is the new better. Yeah. And it's a lot, it's a lot of work too. You know, that that's the really yep. the factor that artists just aren't willing to do. And even more so, I would argue probably handwritten notes are even more special today than they even were then just because uh, yep. everybody's so digital. So, um, man, that is such a great story. And obviously, you know, the rest is history with, with Taylor Swift. Um, besides Taylor, are there any other inspirational stories of artists that you've worked with or had significant moments where your influence has changed an artist's life that you'd like to share? Yeah. So there's a songwriter in Nashville. Um, uh, it's the first artist I started working with actually after Taylor uh, to back up a second. So six months after Taylor and I went on our journey is when I was then asked to be her manager. And that's how I got into management. I went from big machine to managing her and then was with her until 2008. Um, and then I had a choice that I had to make. Do I become a millionaire or do I stay, you know, married and be a father to my kids? And that story's kind of been documented. It's like, was getting ready to become an instant millionaire in 2008 and I was gone 185 days and I'm like, all right, God, what's the plan? You know? So ended up choosing the family, started working for Sony right after I left Taylor, this gentleman reaches out to me and he's like, Hey, big fan of the work you do with Taylor. I said, thank you. He says, but I have this artist I want to share with you. She's only 14. I'm like, of course you do. Uh, Cause at this time after leaving Taylor, every dad with their daughters who could sing were showing up and, sundresses and cowboy boots with a blank check want me to make their daughter the next Taylor Swift. And I'm like, I wish it were that easy. Uh, no one ever asked about the work ethic. They always thought it was the clothing uh, and the curly hair. No, those, yeah. those are other, the, her superpower is her work ethic. Yeah. But uh, there was this young girl named Jordan Shellhart and uh, Jordan, uh, it's Jordan with a Y. And I heard these songs. And once again, it was the songs. That's what got me with Taylor. When Scott offered me the job at Big Machine, he sent me the songs and I just listened to the lyrics. And I'm like, oh my gosh, the way this girl crafts these lyrics. So there was this young songwriter, Jordan. Um, and I heard these songs. I agreed to talk to her and her mom. I said, listen, if she's looking to quit high school and be homeschooled, I'm not your guy. I said, uh, these kids need to finish school. They need to get some life experiences. Uh, there's no rush. There's no hurry. And one of these songs that she wrote, she wrote right after her brother passed, just previously before that. So when I heard these songs, I called Frank Rogers, uh, who was at Seagale at the time. And I'd met Frank when we were out with Brad Paisley. And I said, I'm just going to send you these songs. I said, I don't want to put anything in your head, but I just want you to hear these songs. He heard the songs. He said, I'd love to meet this girl. So I flew out to Nash. I was still living in California, flew to Nashville, met Jordan right after her uh, her birthday and on her 14th birthday she played for uh Chris Dubois and Frank Rogers out at the castle in Franklin and they offered her a publishing deal so here's this little girl about to start her freshman year in high school um, and she got her publishing deal and then we decided we didn't want to wait at that time distribution companies we were allowed to distribute our own music so we recorded this record now keep in mind the whole time i'm still consulting sony and all these other artists but i just kind of kept her under the radar in the development stage we ended up writing a record it was called in a room we recorded it in my office down on villa and i reached out to best buy best buy had a foundation called at 15 and i said listen we've got this 15 year old little girl uh, she's about to turn 15. Their goal was to try to reach kids that were that age. I said, what if we partnered up 
And we partnered up with Best Buy and their foundation. They gave us some money and put things out. So at 14, she got a publishing deal. 15, uh, Joe Galani's like, hey, what's this I hear about Jordan Shellhart? I said, well, she's this artist that I'm working with. We already have a record that's out. So he licensed the record. She got her uh, record deal at 15. Uh, and then she got to debut on the Grand Old Opry on her 16th birthday and have little Jimmy Dickens give her a birthday cake. So that was a fun story <laughs> that kind of came from that. She's still in Nashville uh, doing songwriting as well. But it was just, it was fun little stories. We were always trying to find things that were different. We were always trying to find angles. I did this thing called the Nashville DU Campground Tour where I took a 60 foot Prevost. And I was watching, I always get inspiration from just random areas. So I was at a NASCAR event talking to the guy who runs Camping World. And he started telling me about these like luxury campgrounds. It's like where people come in for three or four days and we're talking like, you know, the it's like they're not wanting for much there. It's not like old fashioned camping. This is like RVs, full on TVs, you know, big screens on the side of the RVs. And I'm like, wait a minute. So there's people trapped there for like three or four days. So I reached out to somebody who owned, uh, you know, a couple dozen of these campgrounds on the East Coast. And they paid us and I would bring in uh, artists that no one had ever heard of. And we'd do the Nashville to you uh, campground tour. And I would set up a stage and I ran the sound and I drove the bus. And I had all these songwriters from Nashville, uh, you know, Adam Sanders. He's written a bunch of cool songs uh, for folks and, you know, Daisy Mallory and Jordan and, and everybody, and we'd bring them out and we would entertain and we'd make a boatload on selling merch and go into the different campgrounds and Kate and Casey. We, then we started doing NASCAR events. We were selling, you know, six, seven, 8,000 CDs a summer out of backpacks, uh, in the parking lots of NASCAR events, walking around with just a guitar playing to the people that were tailgating. So yeah, That's we just amazing. had fun. Amazing. I, I love it. And well, and, and I've had the privilege of actually not too long ago. I think just a couple weeks ago I was riding with Adam, who you mentioned. Yep. And uh, wrote with Jordan last year. So, yeah, definitely. You're, the, the, the thing that impresses me with you, Rick, and especially about those stories is just finding ways to create opportunities where other people would miss them. Like nobody would think of going to NASCAR. Nobody would think of, you know, partnering with Best Buy on these things. You, you almost have to have a mind for for marketing and sales and really creating a market somewhere. So where, where do those ideas come from? Is this stuff that's just, just naturally like it's, when it's, it's a gift. I don't know where it comes from. You know, mm -hmm. Scott Borchetta said something to me one time is he's, he just, he said this and I say this humbly. He's like, when I send you into a place, I don't even want to put anything in your head on what I want you to look for. I just want you to go in and come back and tell me, what needs to happen. I remember a story where he said to me, he said, listen, he says, um, and, and this was a, a great, he says, it was at the beginning of Thomas Rhett's career. And he said, listen, he says, this kid's going to be a star. He said, his show is amazing, but for whatever reason, the merch numbers just aren't there. Uh, I said, so he said, he's playing a show down in Florida. Would you go take a look, come back, tell me what you think it goes on. So I get down to Florida. And I go in and the first thing I notice is I can't see the merch stand. So I get in an Uber and I go down the street to a Home Depot and I buy these lights and I come back to his merch guys. And I'm like, dude, we got to light this up. You know, we've got to be able to see what's happening here. So we light up the merch table and then I watch his performance and oh, oh he is so amazing. And everyone's singing and doing all this stuff. And what I recognized was, at no point did he tell them, by the way, that song you just sang is available at the merch table and I would love to come over and meet you after the show and things like that. So it's just a couple little things that we wrote down. And, you know, it's just, I always try to figure out where is the disconnect with the audience or where can I get the audience's attention with the NASCAR all the labels are calling to get their artists to sing the national anthem or to do the one televised thing. I'm like, no, can I have permission to go get the people that are going to be drunk and have their wallets on them in the parking lot that I could go build relationships. It's like, I want to get to the path of least resistance. And I think we still do that sometimes today is that people are more concerned with getting on a playlist 
where they have no idea who actually listened to their song versus running Facebook and Instagram ads where you can retarget the people that watched or listen to your music or things like that. So I'm just wired different. It's like, like what Taylor said, I want a gold record. I said, great, let's go meet 500,000 people. And I saw how we were able to do that utilizing my space, not just waiting for touring opportunities and waiting for the reach that we would get at a radio station, but physically showing up every day using the resources that were available to make this happen. That's what I get excited about the things that I can control. Yeah. I can't control what the label wants to do. I can't control what the next single is going to be. I can't control if they sign another artist that has momentum and my artist is still waiting around to build momentum. That's why I say you show up with the ball rolling, folks. You don't sit around and wait for some. Here's the bottom line. If I can give independent artists that might be listening to this or managers one bit of advice is they are no longer in the startup business. They are looking to invest in small businesses that are already working. When we were selling $20 CDs, we could develop all day long. We could take as much time as we want. But now we're splitting percentages of pennies. It's not the label's responsibility to prove your proof of concept. You have the tools to prove it yourself. And if you can't prove it yourself, don't be discouraged when the labels aren't knocking on your door because all the resources are available and out there to be able to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think this season and the change in the industry, anytime there's a, a change and a, a, a disruption, I mean, there's the tree's going to get shaken and the bad apples are going to fall out. I think that's a lot is what has happened this season with a lot of managers. They're just it's coming to light that they're not really adding value in the way that a manager needs to add value. And really nowadays, what I am hearing from you is it's it's a lot about finding ways to think about marketing and sales and creating an opportunity for an artist and not being like the old school manager where, you know, it was essentially their job to go and just yell at the label until they gave them money to do something. And, you know, that's part of the job is, is having the relationships and the trust established to do that. But it's really the managers who are forward thinking. And it's so common sense. Like I I'm surprised more managers don't think this way, but it's just thinking about ways to market and sell your artists and actually monetize them. Um, so what I would ask you is what advice would you give to artists who are like looking for a manager? What, what, what should they be looking for? And then the inverse of the question too, what, what does a manager look for in an artist? Well, to go on what you said there is that I, I have some amazing friends who are managers in this town that are brilliant and I would not want them to change who they are, but they're now associating themselves and building their teams. A manager that's had success for the last 30 years doesn't need to go learn how to run Facebook ads. He needs to bring somebody into his office that knows how to run Facebook ads. There's a personal manager and there's a day-to-day -day manager. Your day-to-day -day managers need to be up to speed on all the different things that are happening. But the personal manager is guidance, big picture, and structure. And if you want to ultimately get to – there's the, this business is a series of next. I think there will always be a place for that manager. But that manager needs to surround themselves with people. I have a lot of managers that are in my programs that are – very well off managers because they want to stay focused on what they're good at. And they know I'm staying up to date on all the other stuff so they can get me on an hour brainstorm session and say, okay, what are some of the things that are changing in the industry? We need to be on the lookout for when it comes to marketing and things like that. So we'll talk big picture and strategy. So for an artist, one, you are your first manager. You are your first label. You are your first publishing company. You are your first everything. What you should be doing is surrounding yourself with information, not necessarily people in the beginning. Don't expect someone to just, I mean, I just had a, vir a video went viral on TikTok and I get hundreds of people. Will you manage me like you did Taylor? Will you manage me? Will you manage me? Most people don't need a manager. They need management guidance. And physically, I can't personally manage every person who asks, but through the knowledge and experience. And when I learned a few years ago how to put it online and take what's in my brain and put it into trainings, I can help thousands of people like I do now. So for young artists, parents of young artists, manage your expectations, 
know that you need management help and management guidance. And once you start generating income and have a career that needs to be managed, because a manager's job is dealing with the label, dealing with the agent, dealing with sponsors, dealing with the road manager, dealing with the band. There's so many different things that a manager does every day. If you don't have all those things going on, you know, setting up your songwriting sessions, you can do that on your own. Posting on your social media, you can do that on your own. That's where most of you are right now. You're in the creative stage and creation stage. You don't need a manager for that, but you do need management guidance for the managers. Don't fall in love with the horse. Fall in love with the jockey. That's something that I got from Gary V and what I'll explain what it means in the music industry. The songs are the horses. There's, there's thousands of horses that are running around Nashville, but there's a handful of jockeys that have success year after year after year after year. When you watch the Kentucky Derby, it's a fresh set of horses every year, but it seems to be the same jockeys that are riding a different horse. I have fallen in love with the music. I have fallen in love with the song. I have invested. Manager does not equal investor. I have invested my own money and learned the hard way because I just believe so much in the music and the artist at the time. And then the artist ended up changing their mind. I look for the things that I can't teach. I can't teach work ethic. I can't teach determination. I can't teach resilience. I can't teach someone to show up every day. I can go get you in a room with Seth. I can go get you songs. I can go get you production. I can get you to perform better and sing better. So I always look for the things that I can't teach those intangibles. That's what I personally look for. I'm not telling anyone what they should be looking for, but those are the things that I look for. Well, I think that's so smart. And and really, I guess the next thing, I, I love that you kind of broke those two down. There's a personal manager and a day-to-day -day manager. And usually for people out there who don't know, a management deal, you're, you're going to sign most of the time with a company that has you know, maybe the owner is kind of that big picture, that personal manager. You're sure. not going to be talking on the phone with them every day, maybe maybe once a month, if that. But then you're going to have a day to day point person who, like Rick said, is helping you with your social media or your schedule or your booking travel, your ads, whatever, whatever it is. So um, how does an artist ultimately know when they're ready for a manager? When they are generating enough income to pay that person. Let me just say that. Manager's work's done on the front end. There may or may not be a back end. So if all of a sudden you've had three or four songs that hit on, on the playlist, if all of a sudden Spotify, you're, getting, you're releasing songs and all of a sudden you're getting 500,000, 600,000, a million streams, then all of a sudden those companies are starting to reach out to you with branding deals and things like that. That's when you're ready for a manager. Just because you have one video that pops off on TikTok does not mean you're ready for a manager. But hey, if you feel you are, great, then pay that person. That's the bigger problem is the old model was, well, a manager gets paid when I get paid. Well, unfortunately, 90 whatever percent of people don't get paid but I'm doing all the work on the front end. So you'll pay a voice person, you'll pay an attorney, you'll pay a PR person, but you want me to work for free until you make money, not gonna happen anymore. So you know, you're, you're getting an education, someone's actually doing work for you, you should be. So that's such a tricky question because every situation's different. Someone could come to me right now because they had something pop off and I can see the next five things that I would wanna do with this artist, so I would structure a deal because I see that there's an opportunity that if they just had me all in, that this would happen. But there's also people that reach to me every day that want me to be all in that haven't written more than three songs. You know, they don't have a catalog of music. They haven't played a hundred shows. You know, it's like I, you, you have so much more to do and so much more to learn because the problem for me is that people know who I know. So they'll come to me and going, hey, I heard you on uh, Seth's podcast. So you and him are pretty tight, right? Yeah, he's had quite a few number ones, won a couple of Grammys. I want you to get me a meeting with him. I would love for him. And so what I know is that when I call Seth, Seth's going to start asking me questions about this artist. So if I do not have the answer yes 
to the questions that I know Seth is going to ask. I just wasted that opportunity reaching out to Seth. So what I try to do is tell artists, I will prepare you for those opportunities. Have you been in a room? Have you co-written before? It's amazing. A lot of people want to go co-write with the king, you know, but they haven't been in a room with any, with the poppers yet. You know, it's like start working at the level that you're at so that we can get you up to there. Because if all of a sudden I put you in a room with Seth and the first two hours are doing basic things, he's going to be like, dude, this person's not prepared. It's like, send them. It's like the reason why most people that get drafted by pro teams start in a development league. It's not that they're not talented. It's not that they weren't talented enough to get the deal. It's just, there's things that they have to go through first. So I'm always trying to manage expectations and prepare them for whatever opportunities. Cause it's real easy to open a door. It's very hard to stay in that door. It's easy to get a record deal. It's hard to keep a record deal. Uh, you get one right now. It's like, it's so crowded out there. I feel people are looking for reasons to say no, just to say, okay, I gave him a shot. So I'm always trying to make sure that people are ready to take their shot so that they don't get that. No. And that's not the most popular position to be in a lot of times because in their heart, they feel, man, if you were my, it's like the days of the star makers, the Clive Davises, it's like, you know, back in the eighties where if you had one manager and the right record deal and the right tour and agent, everything you put out went platinum and everybody made money and everybody was making millions. Those days are gone. Mm. Well, I love that you said that that's really artists should focus on starting working at the level that they are at. Yes. I think, man, I just want to hit, I want to say that again, start working at the level you are at. So many artists think they're on chapter 30 when they're really on chapter two. And like you said, it's not a talent thing. It's not, are you good enough? It's not, can you sing good? It's not, can you write great songs? It's a level is, is so much more than that. And, and a lot of that is the time and work ethic put in over a consistently long amount of time. It's just, there's an unex like time isn't the answer because there's a lot of people, as you and I both know sure. who put in 10 years and they never make anything of it. So time in and of itself is not a guarantee of success. Well, we're trying to function in a dysfunctional business because your rewards are not in direct proportion to the work that you put in. Mm -hmm. You can show up to work every day, put in many hours, do everything right. And you're still at the mercy of a outside source determining whether you feel it's good enough or not. That's why I don't like that route. And I don't coach that route. I want you to go find, we, we are in a, whether you like it or not, we are in a capitalist society when it comes to the music, the market will decide whether it's good enough. <laughs> Every song that a label puts out in the building Everyone thinks it's good enough. Somebody signed off on it that this is going to be the biggest hit that this artist has ever had. And it gets put out into the market and the market decides and the market has sent many a person back with their tail between their legs before. So what I suggest is finding the right market and establishing some success. Florida Georgia Line, the best example of not getting a deal when they played for everyone. They put their song out. It sold 100,000 downloads, and then they get their record deal. It was the same song that everyone said no to. The lyrics didn't change. The melody didn't change. It was the perception that changed. They, The market dictated that, okay, you guys at the labels may not get this new sound and this whatever it is that they were doing at the time, as I heard it referred to a lot, Back then, I signed him to a merchandise deal, which was awesome because when everybody else said no, I said, hey, let's do this. So I signed him to their first merch deal. Uh, Seth England came to me. I'm a huge fan of Seth. He had this belief in these guys. We met. I watched the kids in the audience singing the song. I didn't care how they looked on stage. I didn't care about all this other stuff. So the market will decide if you're brave enough to take it to market. They were. They had Craig Wiseman. They had Joey they had Chief. They had some of the biggest heavy hitters in Nashville behind them, but no one could understand. And I don't say no one because that team saw the deal, but the other labels just weren't quite sure yet because it was so different. Remember what I said earlier? Different is the new better. Boom. They go out 
and they have what the best selling song in country music with that song yeah. or now I think they may have had another one since then, but different is the new better. Stop trying to be the next somebody and be the first you different is that's the tweet of the day. Different is the new better. That's I'm putting so it on well a shirt. Said. I'm, I'm yeah. sure we're going to, we, we may even end up uh, titling the episode that so I think it's <laughs> worth, worth noting. So, um, I do want to ask one more question just because sure. a lot of artists, and this is something that I get a lot on DMS or, you know, through our Academy, people are always looking for the red flags. So what, what are some red flags and overall signs that, that you should not, if you're from the artist perspective, sure. That you should not work with a particular manager. Yeah. If someone's going to use the word guarantee in any part of their vocabulary, uh, stay away from that. If you if the, the big scam that's going on right now, and I'm just going to call it a scam, and uh, there's some companies in Nashville that the, the big scam right now is, quote unquote, artist development. So that's the phrase that's being pitched around as we're recording this particular podcast. So people are like, hey, for X amount of dollars, we're going to get, get you an artist development and we're going to put you in rooms with these people. And we've got connections at the labels and this and that. And then you go look at their website and it looks like it was built in 1980. That's a red flag. <laughs> if anyone reaches out to you and they only have a Gmail account. If they say they are a representative of a certain company and you go click on their email and it's from a Gmail account, that is a red flag. The one that's going on right now is, uh, as I'm verified on Instagram, is anyone can start an Instagram profile and get a Gmail, just so you know. So they're hitting me up going, hey, your blue badge is suspect to verification because you know, of copyright infringements, and I don't put any music on my page that doesn't come from somebody that was on that page. All they're wanting me to do is to click that link so that it can put something in my computer and chase me around. So I stay away from that. Anyone who asks you, uh, any manager that tells you and their first plan when they approach you is to go in the studio and record a record and take it to radio, run. They don't understand the business that we're in right now. You do not need, if you listen to the beginning of this podcast, you heard Seth talk about a production program that they're offering. You can go build an audience with the tracks that you make, that you put your songs over. You want to build an audience first on these demos, these work tapes, these ideas, you do not want to go to a bunch of strangers with something you just spent $60,000 on and try to make it work. Uh, those are some of the red flags that I look for. But I also say, if you have someone in your world that's willing to learn, that's enthusiastic, that believes in you, that you trust, that person could be your first day-to-day -day manager. You just help provide them the education that they need. Don't wait for someone to go get the education to help you run your business. Sometimes invest in the education and do it together. I have a lot of people in my management program that are teams. You know, it's like they're learning together. I love that idea. You know, and then go partner with a bigger manager at the time who can open more doors for you, but show up with something. You asked me earlier, and I don't think I answered it. The things that you should look for is one, someone that you trust, someone that can help you get from point A to point B. So in my situation, the way I manage artists today, it's really hard for me. I don't quite get all the music from the artists that I manage right now, but they don't need me to get it. They've got creation people for that. I always tell them, you create it, I'll teach you how to get rid of it. I'll teach you how to build an audience. So don't wait for someone to absolutely fall in love with you. Now, when you hire someone that's going to represent you, they better absolutely love you and everything about your music. But you don't necessarily have to have someone who knows you yet. It's like, it's, think of it like this. Do you want to wait to get to know your doctor before he treats you? Or do you want to get treated? And because of that treatment, you and your doctor become buddies. That's one set that kills me is because they want to wait for me to fall in love with them and their music without before I they want to pay me to help them. I think that's a huge mistake. Get the help that you need because I fall in love with the work ethic. I always tell people they'll come to me. They're like, 
hey, would you listen to my song and tell me what you think about it? And I'm like, okay, so is your audience a 54 year old white dude that loves hip hop from the 19 or, you know, 1990s and 2000s <laughs> that also digs himself a little Matthew West and for King of Country and his favorite artist is Prince. Cause if it's not, I might not be the right person to listen. And they, they, then they understand it and they get it. I'm like, look, be careful. Don't ask too many industry people for their opinions on your music because they're all going to have different ideas. Seth's going to listen to a song completely different than I listen to a song because he has a trained ear, because he's a producer, because he's a hit songwriter. The first thing I ask people is what are your goals with it? Well, I want to go to radio. Then I can take a look at something without ever hearing it and go, well, at four minutes and 30 seconds, that's not going to happen. I didn't even have to listen to the song to tell you that if your goal is radio and you're walking in with a four and a half minute long song, that's probably not going to work. Yeah. They're like, wait, you didn't listen to it. I don't have to because there are certain things that I know apply. Uh, if I listen to a song and you don't catch my attention in the first 30, 35 seconds, then we're not working together because on playlist, on everything, it's that two second, three second, four second, five second game and window that we're in right now. So I can listen to it and tell you that. The problem is, is I don't know how to fix it. Hmm. So that's when I would call somebody like Seth and say, okay, what should they do to fix this? So that's why don't ask, just because I worked with people and I've done this stuff, I'm not the guy to help you fix your songs. Now I have access to the people that can help you fix your songs, but don't expect them to do it for free. If I'm going to reach out to a professional and I'm going to say for all you Seth as an example, if you come to me with three or four songs and you, and I agree to sit down and listen to them and I tell you, listen, they're almost there, but you should meet with a friend of mine. You should be prepared to pay a person to help you fix what's broke, just like you would in any other business. Why people expect songwriters to fix their stuff for free. Why people expect producers to listen to their music for free and tell them what they they paid the first time to get it done, but now they want the guy that's the pro to, it just doesn't make sense to me. It's like the time is that one commodity we can never get back. I start every conversation when I'm looking for help, I'll reach out to someone on Instagram and I'll say, what, what What is your price for an hour of your time? I would like to buy an hour of your time. Do you know that the majority of time with me leading with that approach, people are just so blown away that I offered to pay for their time that I normally don't end up paying for their time because they now see me as a professional. They mm -hmm. see me as someone who it's almost like that going to the doctor for that free consultation, but knowing that the doctor will consult you for free, but he's not going to do the surgery for free. Same thing with an attorney, same thing with a lot of folks. So that's how I look at it is I will maybe sit down and say, it's this and this and this, and then this is what it costs in order to fix it. But don't be afraid to invest in yourself. If you've set your business up properly, it's a write-off at that point. But if you are going to just wait to go the free route, know it's going to take you longer. Know that it's not going to get the phone answered as quick. Know that it's not going to get the emails answered as quick as it would you showing up and showing someone that you respect what it is that they do. Sorry about that little rant. That's so good. I think it needs to be said and I'll just reiterate it again. Cause I mean, how many times do you and I get those messages of, Hey, can I take you to coffee? I'd love to pick your brain. Like that's the worst thing that anybody can say. It's, it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's as Gary V says, you know, it's, it's asking before you're giving. It's, it's not, it's not really adding value at all to the person. And well, and it's a, it's a, it's a danger to you as well. And I did that in the beginning when people would come to me and take me to lunch and they would tell me their story. What they wanted me to say was, Oh my gosh, I think your artist is the most talented thing I've ever seen. And I'll walk them across the street to big machine. Cause at the time I was working with big machine and Sony. And what I would usually do was tell them the work that needed to be done. We would leave. I got a sandwich and then I would look and they didn't do anything because, and that's when I'm like, wait a minute, that hour of time that I just gave them, the labels pay me tens of thousands of dollars for that same information. And this person got it for free. The value of free is just that free. 
And that's the worst thing that we can do sometimes is to continue to not put a fire under someone. If you pay, you pay attention. And then I would sit there and go, wow, I gave them all the tools to do it. The same exact tools. The thing with this, everybody asks, it's like, Rick, what made Taylor so special? Her follow through. Her follow through. We give the same resources. We can sit in a workshop and give the same resources to 20 artists. Why is it that one or two of them will succeed? Because one or two, two of them thought different and had follow through. It's like going to high school. Same yeah. teachers, same hours of the day, same resources, one valedictorian. Yeah. One yeah. person just took it and had different goals and different desires than somebody else. Not saying that everybody who didn't make valedictorian, but that wasn't their goals or their dreams. If your goals are to make it in this business, you have to treat it like a business and you have to be willing to get uncomfortable. Too often, the work is what's going to make you uncomfortable and that's what people avoid. That's the person I want to work with. The person that's like, bring it on, bring it on. Yep. And if it's easy, everyone would be doing it. If there was a formula, we would be on the corner selling it, but there's not. It's like there, there are no two artist career paths have ever been the same. The planets did not align up on the same day for everyone. Sometimes you get in a position. It's like you get the opportunity before you're ready and prepared for that opportunity. But the strong will survive. Ask Bruno Mars, ask the Beatles, ask Garth Brooks, you know, ask Taylor was in a development deal at a major label and nothing was happening. And she asked out and then she got found her champion. You know, that you hear these stories over and over. We're not saying them to put a damper on your dreams. We're telling you because the struggle is real. Yeah. It really is. As cheesy as that T-shirt and bumper sticker sounds, the struggle is real. Yeah. Yeah. And man, I love that you brought that up, that it really is Taylor Swift's follow through. Because how many times do we teach a workshop or, or, or do these podcasts and then people listen to them and really don't do anything with that information? You know, you and I aren't doing this right now just because, well, I, I do enjoy talking to you. Sure. But the hope with this is that it's, it's education for action. So right. most, but, but the truth is, is that most people don't take that action. They just listen to read all the books. They take all the courses. They go, they do all the podcasts and they, and they never actually do it. Well, and I told someone the other day, I said, at some point you have to stop learning and start doing, and I didn't mean stop learning. You never stop learning, but you know, they, they get locked in. And a lot of it is because they're scared. A lot of it is they think that they're just going to find some magic secret in a book or a course. No one wants to buy another course. They want the result of that course. Yeah. The only way you're going to get the result is if you actually put something into play. Fail, but fail fast. Mm -hmm. My best successes and my brightest seasons have come after massive failures and were complete darkness, you know, where it's like I sit there and I'm like, okay, God, I know there's a message in here somewhere. How do I get out of my own way to find it? You know, I remember the first time I spent $10,000 to go to a week. It was a 10 X empire with Brenda Burchard and it was only 200 people, $10,000. And I went to my wife and she's one of those, well, if you pay it, what do you get? That kind of like that hourly employee mentality. It's like, Oh my gosh, what are you going to get for $10,000? I said, I know I'm excited to find out. Cause one day I would love to charge somebody 10 grand for a week. So I went in and I knew the people that were going to be there. And my whole job is helping other people, asking questions, being the fixer, you know? So I pray that week, God, let me be a student. Please just let me be a student. Let me go there and shut my mouth and just listen to what's being said and what it is that you want me to hear. Because sometimes the ego will step in and I'll know the answer to the question. It's like my wife and I, when we first started dating, we took a Spanish class together and she would always laugh because I'd always want to be the one to answer the questions. You know, I was that guy. And she's like, oh, you're just always wanting that attention. Uh, yeah. You know, it's kind of the performer in me sometimes. But I also know that at times, which is now more times than not, I'm like, God, let me just be in the background. Let me be a good listener. Let me hear something where I can help solve and serve someone else. And 
I sit down with entrepreneurs all the time. And I, and, and I say this with artists as well. If you lead with a servant's heart, the money will find you because someone will say, that's the person that I want to invest in. That's the person that I can trust. That's the person that shows up day after day after day. People think they know me because they see my ads all the time. What they don't understand is I'll spend about $100,000 in Facebook and Instagram ads to get your attention to where you're like, wait, I know that guy. Let me go see what he has. You know, right now, you know, Seth, your Instagram game with all all those teaching videos and the things that you're doing with IGTV. It's like you're giving a solid education. Uh, I was on an event the other night on Clubhouse, and I know we had talked, to, we'll talk about Clubhouse here for a second. All of a sudden, somebody had a question. I just popped in and answered it, and I popped back out. And this guy's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I don't know if you guys know who that was. And then he just builds this stuff up. And then this gal, Erica, she goes, Mr. Barker, he's a legend. We studied him at Berkeley. I'm like, what? She's like, I said, first off, don't call me Mr. Barker because that makes me feel old. <laughs> Calling me a legend makes me feel dead. She started laughing. I said, but I understand it's the Southern respect. I said, what do you mean that you studied me at Berkeley, there's people paying a lot of money for certificate courses, and there's people paying a lot of money for these degrees on theory. She goes, oh, we did a whole session on your marketing practices. I'm like, interesting. I said, can I get you on video to say that so I can use it in my marketing? And she <laughs> <laughs> understood what was going on, but it's the same thing with artists. You know, when I'm teaching you how to go in and do voice messages in Instagram and you're able to say a fan's name, I wish these tools were around when I was working with Taylor. We would have had so much fun. I mean, we had to borrow her fiddle player's Facebook page because we weren't college students. And those were the only people at the time who had access to Facebook. Her fiddle player, Emily, went to Belmont. So we started trying to build Taylor's audience off of Emily's Facebook page. Amazing. But the tools that we have now, oh, I geek out on them. I totally, it's like, you. oh, yeah, I don't even get me started. That's a whole nother episode. No, well, you're, you're, you're getting to really what, what was going to be my next question, going back to Taylor Swift and the way that she was able to engage with her fans. Can you tell us about what you call the power of fan engagement and how, you know, you were behind a lot of that with her? I, well, I wasn't actually, I was behind, I was, I was helping come up with the ideas and helping facilitate the ideas. But like we said, the artist still has to do it. The artist still has to do it. So when I saw she was working on her MySpace stuff way before I even came along, she already had this audience. I just looked and saw how we could amplify it. So it was the after show signings. It's like if we, her goal, she wanted to meet 500,000 people. Well, we have 10,000 people at a show. The venues have agreed that we can stay after and sign autographs for a couple hours. So we had to learn how to get through as many people as we possibly could. Uh, so that was one that worked out really well for us. Uh, the thing too with Taylor, what was great is she was willing to try a lot of things. So I had to be very selective on what I brought her. And as a manager, this is a, a tip that I'll give you here. If you just show up with every crazy idea that you have and the artist tries four or five of them and they don't see any success, the psychology now is every time Rick shows up, he brings me work, but no results. That's, that's what it is. So sometimes you have to vet these things out on your own. So best example, and I love to share through stories. We're in Fresno. We're doing one of those uh, outdoor shows. Uh, Jason Michael Carroll, Jack Ingram, Taylor. Taylor is the baby act on that. We carry merch everywhere we go. The record companies, you'll have like this, this pad of autograph pictures and things that you do at the radio station. So all of a sudden, I see this group of people that are standing outside the fence for like starting to become up on a little over an hour. So I go and I said, why don't we just let those people in, let them get a beer, a hamburger, whatever, uh, they said, well, we're still doing sound check. I'm like, dude, the gate, it's an outdoor show. They're 25 yards from the stage. They're hearing the sound check. Why don't you let them in? 
and the promoter couldn't understand it. So I grabbed Taylor and I said, listen, let's go outside. Let's introduce ourselves to all the people that are standing in line waiting to get into here. So I walk out with a pad of paper. I said, hey, guys, my name's Rick. I want to introduce you to Taylor Swift. Most of you don't know her, but she'll be playing here in just a little bit. And while you're waiting, if you would like a picture, uh, take a picture, we'd love to meet you. And you can get pictures autographed for only five bucks. So people who didn't even know who they were started handing us money. We're autographing. So Jack Ingram's laughing hysterically because he's on stage sound checking and we're making 500 bucks outside the fence waiting for people to come in. So now when she starts the show, all these people flood up to the front of the stage because now they feel they know her. They've made this connection with her. So then after the show, she invites them to meet her at the merch table. She goes to the merch. She sells more merchandise than the headliners on that show based off that. So what happens at the next event that we get to? She comes up to me. Hey, can we go outside and meet the fans? Can we go outside and meet the people? I don't have to ask her anymore. Now it's her idea. We went out in the snow in Utah. We were opening up for Trick Pony and the snow was happening. And I said, Taylor, there's a whole bunch of people outside. She grabs her jacket and she said, let's go. Now it's her idea. It's her mission to go out and meet all these people. That's what I loved about her is she was willing to try anything. We would go outside. Venues would tell us that we couldn't sign anymore. We would go in the parking lot and cars would turn on lights so that people could take pictures back when their phones were starting to do that. Like her music, don't like her music, say whatever it is that you want to say. She is special because of the fact that she was willing to do things that were different while everyone else was sitting backstage drinking beers with the band after shows she was out there signing autographs for two three four hours she did a meet and greet in nashville during cma music fest i wasn't with her at the time i was already gone that lasted i think 14 something hours she is phenomenal how is it that she can sell a million cds to people that don't own cd players because they invest in her relate and she just did it recently at the recording of this twice in like a month and a half she released one album and then no notice here's the second one and boom millions of copies she know they know that when they go buy her cds and things that she's the one personally putting the touches on them and doing all this stuff why people haven't learned from that and tried to be different is beyond me but hey yeah no that's the difference between a superstar and a normal artist is the superstars are very involved in their business. They treat it like a business. And th there's better singers, dancers, performers than a lot of the superstars. But if you sit down with any of these superstars, the one thing you're going to see in common is they know what's going on in their business. They're very hands-on in their business. And that's something that is different. But, I mean, I could geek out on her all day just with what I continue to see her doing because it's awesome. These kids have grown up with her. You know, I always apologize to dads because they know all the words to the Taylor songs, because in the beginning, our goal was to, you know, get the kids who controlled the radio to play her songs in the morning, mm. you know, yeah. but yeah, well, I, 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 I miss her, man. It's been like 12 years since we've even had a conversation and I still just watch and look at what mm. she does and just find it amazing. So good. I'd love to speak to the artists who may not have a team or management yet. How can they get a head start on creating and monetizing their fan base? Go to rickbarker.com. I hate to even sit there and try to say that, but it would it would take us forever. The first thing you need to understand is that you need to understand how to schedule. Time management is so important. Uh, one of the first courses I ever created was called Social Media for Music, and that will teach you how to speak the different languages of the different platforms, what platforms you need to be on, how to create your content, how to schedule your content. So what I did with the courses that I created was I tried to give you me without me physically having to be there so that you can get that part set up and then you can come see what the next level and access to me is. Most people want to come for the highest price point first, but there's so much that needs to be done. So I always try to make sure that it's an evolution. We call it the, the ladder. You're just climbing up the ladder and don't be afraid to start at the bottom because everything that we do in this business is a series of next. 
You know, okay, you've got that accomplished. Great. What's next? You've got that accomplished. Great. What's next? So make sure that you're not trying to fast track this process. Uh, and, and then to, if you've got people that are around you that want to help, you know, you have a friend of yours that's great with social media, let them help you. You have a friend of yours that's the organizational freak, let them help you get your songs registered. Let them go study what it means to have a PRO and how to register with a PRO. But there's so much stuff that has to be done on the front end. I just did a TikTok video showing people how to use their Instagram to play their Spotify song and that they get paid. And the number of responses is like, well, how do you get paid? When you get paid, who sends you the money? And I'm like, wait, these people are putting music out that they don't even know how to register with a PRO and they don't even know what a PRO is. So I need to back up and say, okay, before I teach them this, how to drive this Ferrari, I need to teach them how to drive a stick. Yeah. So yeah. that's what I've seen sometimes that we have to go backwards, but yeah, just find yourself. There's some really good people out there, you know? Don't be afraid to invest in yourself. If you've set your business up properly, your education is a tax write-off. You know, Seth's got great courses in the songwriting space. I know Logan, who works with him, did some stuff on the marketing. I've got, you know, I, I've got management. I've got social. I've got how to run ads. I mean, there's just go. There's so many great people out there that provide value on YouTube, Instagram, and socials. And then what you do is when you find one that you connect with, your thought process should be, okay, what of theirs can I buy to go deeper with them? I like their teaching style because I'm not for everyone. Seth's not for everyone. There's, But there's people that we can refer you to that can help you. Uh, so, yeah, I, I hope yeah. that answers your question. Yeah, well said. A um, couple more questions, and then we'll jump into our lightning round. Lightning round gonna sample that <laughs> i love that when i'm listening to the show i just love when they say that so funny um covid19 and i hate to even just bring this up but as the time of recording this now we're still dealing with the effects of covid19 love it or hate it you probably hate it covid19 has been a real challenge for musicians and artists across the board but you've been able to provide many of your clients and followers with amazing strategies and tactics so Tell us a little more about what that's looked like in the past year. So what's interesting is that I've been teaching artists for the last three years how to live stream, how to utilize virtual tip jars. Uh, started out with PayPal and then Venmo and Cash App. It's like all this stuff. So many of my artists, and I have clients all over the world, I'll give you one good example, the Bell Rays. The Bell Rays are a husband and wife punk rock duo out of Riverside, and they played four nights a week. So all of a sudden in March, they show up to the management session and Lisa was like, okay, Rick, uh, things are shutting down here in California. I said, well, go back into the course and start studying the social media stuff that I told you. So she goes back into the course and they'd been avoiding it. They're older artists, you know, they fought it for a long time, uh, had the cure to the disease right in the cabinet and wouldn't, you know, take the medicine. So she comes back and she's like, oh my goodness. She said, we did everything that you asked us and told us to do. And she said, what you told all of us to do. So I told this on a call with about 160 artists. I said, you guys need to go in. You need to do this. So she sends me an email. She said, in March, our stores, our tips and merch store sales were $32. Since implementing what you told us, We've been averaging between $3,500 and $4,500 a month. Wow. And what they realized was is that when right now people aren't distracted by shows, they're not in their cars driving to work. Most of them are working from home. Most of them are going to this device called a phone to try to get away from whatever it is that's bothering them. And you now have the ability to show up. So they started doing an Instagram live every week, a Facebook live every week. And then we taught them how to start running ads to get their message in front of the right people. Marty Ray, Marty Ray reaches out to me. Uh, he's one of my clients. This was on Easter. And he says, hey, man, did a show last night, made $4,300. Now, this is Easter of COVID. This is at the beginning of lockdown. He showed up, provided value to his fans that were also looking for an escape, and he gave them the opportunity to spend money with him. 
What I do not want you thinking is, Rick, people aren't going to pay right now. Well, they definitely aren't if you don't ask them. You need to give them ways to invest in an experience with you. We've done high ticket sales. We've done everything. Put together a t-shirt, put together something, but don't be afraid to let people know. Because here's the part, and I did a video on this because I knew an artist never would, is I, and that was like what you can do as a true music fan. I said, right now, the independent artist that you're using their songs to propose to your wives and your girlfriends and the first songs that your dances that you're going online saying how great they are right now, they are independent. What that means is they fund their whole operation. What's worse is the jobs that they do part-time to fund the operations have been taken from them. Baristas, waitresses, bartenders, Uber drivers, Lyft drivers. So how can you support your favorite artist? Go to their merch stores. When they go online and do a live show, don't be afraid to tip. So artists, don't be afraid to have a merch store. Don't be afraid to tell people that you could use their help. Don't be afraid to ask for tips. Uh, the key is it's all in the storytelling. It's all in the way you frame it. Humble and gracious. And that's something that I told Taylor early on. As long as we always err on the side of humble and gracious, you will always win. Always. Man. That's that's a whole podcast episode in and of itself. So uh, before we jump into the lightning round, where can artists find out more about the music industry blueprint? Which you've got the you've got the for visual people there. You got the sweatshirt on. By the way, when am I going to get one of those? Uh, I just got them. This is a sample. So I did a print on demand utilizing Printify and Shopify to see how they were. Uh, so no, I'll, I'll send you something. I got the hats. I got we're song, you know, I got the journals, I got coffee mugs, I got the the COVID mask, I got it all. I and uh, I don't have to keep inventory, so send them over, man. I'll I'll rock one of them. Absolutely. We'll get them there. We'll definitely so, yeah, get them. Where, there. where can they Rick, find out about Rick, music industry blueprint and keep up with your courses and resources? Everything is at rickbarker.com. That's the hub. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And uh Two more things before we jump into the lightning round. Tell us about your new social media for music course and the ads amplifier for music training. So social media for music every year I do, you know, so it's now social media for music 2021. So what I do every year is I teach you the most uh, up-to-date tactics and strategies when it comes to utilizing the platforms. And what I did different this year is I got, I got frustrated. So I got frustrated because People will buy the course, they'll get excited, and then I'll look at their engagement and their numbers and they're not doing anything. So this time, the strategy I had was I pre-sold the course to the people who owned the last one, and I taught it workshop style. I did, the, I did it in front of a live audience. So the, the trainings are more in-depth, they're more intense, but there's also a Q&A with the people that are there. So much fun, they're saying it's the best thing that we did. So that's the Social Media for Music course. Then I also had all these artists coming to me wanting to work with ad agencies. They weren't in a position to be able to afford the $1,500, $2,500 a month to work with these ad agencies. So I met a guy here in Nashville. His name's Taylor Dempsey, who works for Revidia Agency. And Revidia does a lot in the Christian music space. And we met at an event and we started talking and he works with Lauren Daigle and for King of Country and Chris Tom and all those artists but they can only handle so many artists at a time. And when you've got labels coming to you, you know, your budgets are high. Most artists can't afford that. So we sat down and said, Hey, what are the six types of ads that an artist should be running? He sends me this PDF. I start getting so excited about it. So we created the ads amplifier for music, where we walk you through the six uh, ads that you need to run from discovery to engagement, to lead generation, to fan building all the way through we teach you all the different things that you need to go along with it. And then we go one step further and we actually show you how to create those ads inside the ads manager. And then I also brought in a copyright uh, guy that does copywriting to show you how to create hook story and offer. And we did that live where we went over stuff. So I'm just so excited about that because it doesn't take a lot to get your music in front of the right people. And I see what happens every day when that happens. So all of that you can find at rickbarker.com as well. But yeah, I'm super excited about teaching artists and managers how to be their own little ad agencies without having to, 
you know, be in a position to be dependent on somebody else to do it for you. And then do like I did start as your own and then hire somebody and outsource it after, after a while. Yeah. Well said, well said. Um, we touched a little bit on clubhouse and TikTok. I mean, we could have a whole conversation on that alone, but maybe just give me 30 seconds on clubhouse and clubhouse is like the world's largest networking opportunity. It's like being at a virtual conference every single day, hearing the speakers. It's all voice. It's all done by voice. It's invite only. But what's cool is that I got invited back in November. It was still very hip hop oriented. It was the marketers hadn't found it yet. And then right around Christmas, now you see all the big time marketers that are showing up. So imagine being at the bar or the coffee area after an event and all the people that spoke on stage are there having conversations with each other, trying to one-up each other with information and always trying to bring value. That's what Clubhouse is. You can go in. I do a room every morning, uh, 9 a.m. Central Time, called the Morning Motivation Power Hour, which we start with a quote, and I just try to help people put some positivity in their days, and if they're stuck, we try to help them. But it's, it's absolutely amazing. It can be addicting. You can find yourself in these rooms for three and four hours and go, wow, I've been here a long time, but you can learn so much as well. That's awesome. So every day, is that every single weekday at 9 a.m.? Yeah, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. Central time right now. Uh, I've got somebody else. So uh, right right now, if we go into Clubhouse and we see the rooms that are working right now, uh, Brett Manning just signed up for Clubhouse. Follow him. There we go. so yeah, so there's a room going on right now that uh, that I started this morning. I've got a friend of mine that's running it, and every day we bring value. Like yesterday, for at the recording of this, it's the day after Martin Luther King Day. So yesterday's quote was: "Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others?" So we'll share the quote, and then we'll talk about it, and then we'll move on with our day. I only let it last an hour. So not just music specific. Oh no, this is about life. This is about life. I help creatives. You know, a lot of people will tag me in. I spend just as much time helping Fortune 500 companies see what it is that they can do. Because everything we do for creatives is you need to build an audience, serve that audience, and then monetize that audience. So build, nurture, monetize. That's what I do. So good. Um, Well, hey, are you ready to jump into the lightning round? Yes, I am. All right. Well, let's start. I hope you worked hard on these questions. I I listened to every episode and (laughs) I'm, I'm pumped. Well, we got some good ones for you. Number one, what is your favorite type of movie? Action and comedy. The kind of the combination. I love anything with Kevin Hart, the rock, Will Smith. So it's kind of like that got that comedy action stuff going on with it. All right. Number two, what is a hidden talent that you have? Wow. A hidden talent that I have, you know what? I, I don't I don't know that it's hidden because if it's good, I brag about it to my family because uh, I have teenagers. I got to one up them, but, but uh, I, I'm good at the trivia games for whatever reason. It's like I'm good at trivia. Do you do question of the day on Alexa? No, I have never heard of that. Hey, well, you should get into it. That's what me and my family do every day. It's trivia. Okay. Yeah. Number three, what is your least favorite food? My least favorite food? Yeah. Look at me. Does it look like I don't, I, I don't have a <laughs> at least favorite. I, I don't really have a least favorite. See this lightning round's weird because it makes me think I can't think of the first thing that comes to my head because <laughs> my least favorite food. I don't have one, Seth. All right. It's weird. Collard greens. I don't know. I'll say something. Collard greens. There you go. There you go. Number four. What is your most used emoji? Uh, the fist pump. All right. And number five, where would you like to go that you've never been? Bora Bora. All right. Good, good. Aunt. That one came quick. Have you, have you that one came that one? quick? The rest of the lightning round, I sucked. So we'll call this <laughs> the sucky lightning round. <laughs> I love it though. I want, I was waiting. See, that's the problem with the lightning round is I'm anticipating the questions. You know, what book changed your life? Who's your favorite artist? And now I've got to search for collard greens. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> we try to keep people on their toes here. Get some, some, un- yeah, you kept me on my toes. That's for sure. Um, so, Hey, be- before we uh, sign off, I do want to remind people to go to rickbarker.com to find 
all the things that you need to know. Um, I can't say enough good things about Rick. And just as you can tell, just this episode alone is a testament to his generosity of his knowledge. I mean, if artists literally did nothing more than just take the info that he gave today, they could change their careers. But he has so much more to offer than that. And I really want to encourage people to connect with him. RickBarker.com. Check out his Instagram. Um, if you're on Clubhouse, go follow his Clubhouse uh, Clubhouse rooms. And uh, we are going to be doing our deep dive right after this. And we're going to be talking about a few of the out-of-the-box marketing strategies that you use while managing Taylor Swift. So if people want to get access to that deep dive, they can just go to madeitinmusic.com. Rick, this has been a pleasure. Really appreciate you being on the Made It Music podcast. My pleasure. I've been waiting for a long time. <laughs>